All right. Good morning, everybody, and happy Friday, and welcome to this film and television webinar. My name is Wanjiko, and um, I've been in the TV uh, production or the media industry for about 13 years now, going on 14. I've worked at KBC and TV, Level 1, Miss News Productions, Dance and Productions for BBC, CNBC, CNN, <laughs> worked at Super Sport, and I also teach film and um, television. And um, hi guys, my name is Mark Miner, and I'm a film writer, director, and editor. And yeah, I've I've been majorly uh, working with my own production company, M Green Entertainment, uh, where we've produced a couple of sh successful short films um, that have gone on to even gone to Cannes Film Festival. And at the moment, I'm working on a new local television series called Kina. And yeah, I'm happy to be with you and happy Friday as well. All right. Um, I know a lot of people might be asking why our film and television. Well, um, what we have come to realize is that as the years progress, the two um, media are not really that different. We are seeing more and more television shows being produced like um, feature films in their look and feel. And um, even the content in the way it's put out, they are starting to kind of reflect each other. Um, the only maybe major differences between film and television would be that, you know, in television, the producer is the boss, the producer is king, what the producer says goes. And um, for film, that would be the director. They would be in charge of the look and feel and hiring the cast. And um, sometimes they even dictate what uh, final cut the audience gets to see some um, what we call the director's cut. Um, we combine film and television because especially in our industry we have not yet segregated the two because today you might be working on a film and then the next job you get might be a tv series or a tv show so it's um, important to learn the uh, technical and content aspects of both of them so that you could be able to navigate the industry. Mark? Um, yeah, and mainly I'll be focusing on film and uh, what is the director's job. I will go about how to transition your film from story to a, sc a screenplay. And I will try to focus on the general uh, gap. Just basically, I know there are professionals who already know this stuff, but I will try to mitigate also those who are uh, beginning filmmakers, those who are, you know, thinking of getting into film as well. So. Even, even professional, there are some small details that normally they forget and, 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 you know, to keep reminding them, keep reminding yourself about something will always get you uh, getting better and better and better. Okay. And I will be focusing on um, television productions and television shows. And, uh, you know, TV is a medium that we use to, as a source of information, entertainment, education, <clears throat> and it's also a conversation starter because the media normally sets the agenda for what people um, talk about. I was laughing the other day because I saw somebody on Twitter asking, what was the first TV series that you watched that stopped everything for you? You know, the one that you, you will never forget. And people were giving all kinds of answers, 24, Desperate Housewives, Passions, you know, and um, it's one of those things that even in this uh, COVID era, we've seen that film and television has helped a lot of people to escape. You know, it's given them some form of sanity, entertainment. Uh, people are glued to their screens and we're talking about it. When this um, quarantine period started, I remember everybody was talking about uh, Tiger King. And you know, every Thursday people are always talking about Kina, um, the show that Mark is working on right now. So it's a very important aspect for us to be able to tell our stories from idea conception, scripting, cinematography, and be able to give people the kind of entertainment and escape that uh, they're looking for, especially at this time. So um, television um, is shot, you know, either with a single camera or multi-camera. So a single camera, as the name um, dictates, is where we use one camera only. Um, and the scenes appear to look like it was shot on a location and they're starting to look a lot more like movies, shows like Atlanta, um, where they, they look like they were shot on a location within the world of the story. 
When it comes to multi-camera shows, um, here's where we use more than one camera. Um, so we can get various angles, different angles of, of the action, you know, shows like the Big Bang Theory, which are shot in front of a live studio audience. And uh, you can see various angles of the same action that is taking place. You can see that it is shot on a stage. We can hear the live audience laughing. Uh, sometimes some shows even encourage the live audiences to participate. Uh, the thing is, sometimes these multi-camera shows that are shot on a stage will look a bit stagey or, or, or not so real as compared to single camera shows. The advantages, you know, of um, using a multi-camera um, production or engaging in a multi-camera production could be that you get various angles, you know, so if you're not happy with the one, then you can take it from another angle. Um, if you want to capture different um, uh, scenes or action taking place in two different places, then you can do that. For example, like when we do live football matches or Olympics or concerts, you know, they have cameras. There's some productions, multi-camera productions that can have in excess of 30 cameras. That just means that we can see, for example, like Olympics, we see uh, Usain Bolt when he was running uh, during the sprint and then we go outside, we can see the marathon and then we come back. We can see the medal ceremony, then we come back, we can see the field events, the shot put, the javelin. That's um, an advantage of having a multi-camera production. The disadvantage of something like that, it, has, it is very, very expensive to put on and you need a lot of crew. You know, um, I remember when we were, when I worked at Supersport and we were doing live football productions and cricket, rugby, uh, live sport, um, we had very, very many cameras, very, very many people and it took a lot of time to uh, set up and, and uh, set down. Um, the crew, for example, would be required to be on location five hours before going live. The crew would get their five hours, um, rig all the cameras, do a technical check, ensure that everything is working. We have audio, we have talkback, graphics is working. And then the talent would come in three hours before we go live. And then we would do what we call a facilities check just to make sure that, again, everything is working. If it's the commentators, although we did a technical check with the audio team, the commentators do their own facilities check so we can get their voice levels, the on-screen presenter so we can get you know, their lighting right and where they're supposed to stand. And it is so, so involving. And it's actually, uh, live television is, is something that I love. It's something that I've worked in a long time. And the thrill and the rush that you get, you know, when you hear the director counting down that we are going live. So everybody has to be alert and you have to be focused and you have to be paying attention because with live television, when it's gone, it's gone. You can't um, bring it back. You can't recall it, you can't edit. So everybody has to focus. We have to make sure that we are in sync. We have to make sure that we are listening to the director. Everybody had um, a set of, of comms or the communications unit, which is the talk back. Uh, where the director is able to talk to everybody and they can hear him, they can hear who he's talking to. So if he's calling camera one, camera one, please zoom in or things like that, then we can all hear him. If he's talking to you, you can be able to respond to whatever uh, direction he's given you. So, you know, multicam productions as they give us various angles um, and, and we use uh, different types of cameras, you know, long lenses, um, slow-mo cameras, super slow-mo, steady cams, just so that they can capture all the action. And for me, this was one of the fascinating things about um, live, live production. I remember there's a time we were doing, uh, the crew was doing a cricket, uh, sorry, a rugby production. And uh, as the players were going to score a try, the cameraman at the touchline, you know, he's running alongside them so he can uh, catch the action. And they actually tackled him and he fell down with his camera, you know. So, um, it's so involving. And then all this was caught on, on, on camera, on TV. Um, we did laugh at him, he wasn't hurt though. But um, it's, it's so exciting. And, and even to see like how heavy the steady cam is, you know, it's strapped to the cameraman and he has to, you know, carry the weight of that camera and still get a steady shot, you know. It's, it's something so um, interesting and fascinating when it comes to multi-camera productions. They allow you to have all sorts of different angles. So you have the action on the pitch, you have crowd reactions, you have close-ups on the players, on the referee, you have the camera behind 
the goalposts so you can see goals. Um, now we have VAR technology, you know, you're able to see all these things. So um, when it comes to, to productions, we do them multi-camera or single camera. And um, it, it, the single camera also allows you to, you know, put all your different edits together. So you can stop uh, shooting from one angle, uh, move, change the angle, shoot again, change the angle. Um, but the single camera in that regard is very, very, very time consuming because you start, stop, start, stop, change angles, change locations and things like that. When it comes to how TV and television programs are made, the writers write the show um, and then the producers, you know, they assemble the crew, they, they have the hiring and firing power in television. A producer is king and, you know, they hire people, they work with the budget, they assemble the budget um, and they work with contracts and external suppliers and other clients. And then they also hire the director who then comes in to do the shooting. And then we go into edit and finally it ends up on your screens. So in television, um, mostly the, the director who, who directs the pilot um, sometimes only directs the pilot. And then we can have um, more directors coming in to direct uh, the series or the show as it continues in the season. But sometimes the same director could stay on for the entire season. Um, the main creative decision maker on a TV series is the showrunner. And they're mostly the ones who write the pilot of the show and they go pitching it, you know, for, to networks or for investment, for financing, and um, they're the boss. So they oversee everything and um, they even have uh, the creative power and license to change the story direction, to make changes in the writing. They can decide, um, maybe uh, I want one of the cast members to become a director. In the next episode, we've seen that a lot, especially with shows like um, Grey's Anatomy and Scandal. And more and more, we've been seeing the actors and actresses becoming uh, producers and even directors, you know, um, Reese Witherspoon, Kerry Washington, uh, George Clooney, they're becoming directors, setting up their own production houses because they've been on the job long enough to know um, the technical aspects that happen behind the camera. And that's because um, a showrunner or a writer will allow them and give them that license to be able to do that. Um, in television also, uh, we have scripted shows and non-scripted shows. You know, your scripted television um, is, is the one where, you know, they go according to a script, your dramas, your comedies, your series. Um, news also, because the news um, casters and the news uh, anchors, they read off the auto queue, they read a script of the auto queue. So your Game of Thrones, your Blackish, your Kina, your Monica, all of them scripted shows. But when it comes to non-scripted shows, you know, we have your reality TV, live news, your sports news, we can't script um, a, a game. It just um, takes place. And, and the producer has to figure out what kind of story they want to tell in regard to the sports, the sports game or the reality show. So they, they uh, create their production in that this is our storyline and this is how we're going to shoot it. And this is what we want our audience to um, get in the end, or this is how we want our audience to react, or this is how we want our audience to feel at the end of, of our production. All right. Um, when it comes to scripted shows and, and dramas and comedies and things like that, we watch them from very, very many different platforms. We watch them on broadcast networks, KTN, KBC, ABC, uh, uh, CBS, all those, but we also watch them on streaming services, Showmax, Netflix, Amazon Prime. And, and these streaming services have changed uh, the way we get our content. They've changed uh, the fact that sometimes, you know, some movies don't, don't go to the, the, the cinemas anymore. Sometimes they're just put, depending on the laws of the country, they're put directly on the streaming services or they are commissioned by the streaming services, like how Netflix commissioned um, Lionheart or Bad Box, you know, it's a Netflix original, how they commission um, things like Narcos, or um, I just watched uh, Becoming last night. So these um, streaming services have changed our access to 
what we are consuming, but they have also changed how TV shows are produced. So that when you have a limited series, it seems more like an extended movie, you know, and they are with the streaming services, the, the seasons are a bit shorter. So you'll find something like Narcos had 10 episodes, whereas something like um, maybe NCIS that has been on air, I think since 2003, has 22 episodes. But the simple explanation for this is because when it comes to broadcast networks, they make their money mainly through advertising. So the more episodes they have on air, the more revenue they get in terms of ads. So it's in their best interest to have a longer running series so that they can you know, get more viewers and, and therefore higher ratings. And um, higher ratings uh, translates most times to more advertising from the people that they are targeting to advertise, <coughs> excuse me, on their stations. So the streaming services and the cable networks, your Netflix, your Showmax, your DSTV, they operate on, you know, subscription fees. Yes, they have um, some form of advertising sometimes, but they do operate on subscription fees. And um, on that, those platforms, you basically get what you pay for, depending on your bouquet, your package, what it is you want to see, then um, that's what you'll get, all right? Um, well, so when it comes to the broadcast networks, they um, also are uh, more readily available. You know, they're the ones sometimes, uh, like at least in this region, we call them free to air. So you can get KTN, KBC, Citizen, NTV uh, more uh, readily available and, and cheaper than you would your streaming services and cable networks. Um, we also have what we call pay-per-view, which is um, you pay for like one particular production or one particular show. For example, like if Floyd Mayweather is fighting, you know, then there's a package that you specifically only pay for that for fight night or for the Super Bowl or for such big events like that. Um, so television, uh, we normally consider ratings a lot because the more people that are watching your program, you know, the higher your ratings go, um, the number of episodes, so uh, there'll be more um, in terms of whether they're 20 or 22 uh, episodes, just so that the advertisers can, can, can pour in their money. And then, uh, you know, with broadcast networks, this, uh, the episodes come weekly, as opposed to streaming services where a whole season is placed there for you and you can binge watch it at your convenience. But um, when it comes to broadcast networks, you have to wait um, weekly to, to catch the next episode. Um, that's how I remember, like some of us, we watched uh, Desperate Housewives or Prison Break. You had to wait for it to come next week, next week. But now you have the luxury of just sitting down on your streaming service and watching the entire season for yourself, okay? Um, one of my favorite Kenyan producers is um, Naomi Kamau. She is the brains behind, you know, Mother in Law, Tahiti High, Machachari, Reflections. And, and I remember she started out when she was reading her poetry um, on a show on, on KBC, you know, and all this evolved and, and she became this powerhouse that we have today that you know, she writes these shows that reflect society and that people can, um, exp they can express what's happening and people can connect with and identify with. Um, like, especially like Tahidi I remember we all connected with Tanya and Omosh and all the characters. And you know, they're funny and they're, um, they're, they're readily available. You know, they're on our uh, free to air networks. And, and she's done a lot in terms of producing, directing, and acting, and putting um, Kenyan productions, you know, uh, available for us and, and telling Kenyan stories and African stories, which I think is very important for us, especially at this point in time where Africans are actually ready and prepared and, and gearing up to tell African stories from our perspective in our words, um, as opposed to having maybe Hollywood or other um, outside um, forces telling our stories for us. Um, Shonda Rhimes, you know, the brains and the powerhouse behind shows like Grey's Anatomy and Private Practice and Scandal, How to Get Away with Murder. And she started out, you know, being told no a lot. And um, networks would turn down her 
her ideas and her suggestions and her pilots. And, and one thing I like a lot about her is that she, she has said that she noticed that there was a gap on television for shows that have a leading female and a leading female uh, a character of color. So then she developed this show. So when we watch like Grey's Anatomy, we see Sandra Oh. When we watch um, Scandal, we see um, Kerry Washington as Olivia Pope. And, and when we watch How to Get Away with Murder, we see Viola Davis as Annalise Keating. And you know, these are some of the things that, that you know, producers do when they sit down and they think, what would I like to see? What is missing in the programming that I am watching? What is missing in the stories that are being told currently? Oh, it's the leading female character of color. Okay, cool, I will create that. And it's always a beautiful thing to see. She then went on to form her own production um, company called Shondaland. And then um, she's been very successful living in scoring deals with Netflix and extending her contracts with like ABC. And, and as, as producers, you know, um, given that we always need, um, you know, people to aspire to. For me personally, Naomi and Shonda are the people that I look up to in terms of producing and how are they writing? What is their writing style? How are their characters, what kind of dialogue? Are they writing the dialogue for their characters? What are their characters saying? Um, what kind of characters are they writing? Are they strong? Are they weak? Are they manipulative? It's always um, fascinating to watch the process and see how it works um, behind the scenes. And um, the, the, the only difference between a film producer and a television producer is that in TV, um, again, a producer has hiring and firing power. They get to decide who acts on, on, on their shows or who is cast or who is the director, who is the crew. Um, I remember uh, Shonda Rhimes has a policy that you're, as if you're working on any of her productions, your personal life cannot affect the production. So for example, um, in Scandal, <clears throat> Um, there was a, a character called Harrison Wright, he's played by Columbus Short, and in, in his personal life around the end of season three, he was in the news and the tabloids and the blogs for something that had happened. And I remember season four of Scandal started with his funeral, like she killed him off the show because she was like, you know what, they, I don't want your personal life to affect the production life. So those are some of the tough decisions, you know, you have to make as a producer in television. In film, you know, the producer plans and coordinates the visual aspects of the film, um, you know, scripting and, um, you know, arranging for funds. And they also handle uh, like marketing and uh, distribution for these films. And they work, you know, in tandem with the director just so that the director's vision can be realized at the end of, of the film. Um, I just want to remind all our attendees and our participants that uh, you can ask your questions on the Q&A and um, the, we will answer them as we go along. You can also maybe type them in the chat box if you would like, and we'll answer them as we go along. For now, I'd like to hand over to Mark so he can tell us about the fascinating world of film. Mark. Yes, so um, do you like going to the movies? Then if you do, then it's very possible for you to become a film director. I always advise, uh, you know, like people who want to get into the industry that the more you watch films, the more you, 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 you get that knack of creative vision, you get the knack of how to uh, think critically about characters, think critically about situations, you know, creating or rather engaging viewers and stuff like this. So what you're going to, basically discuss is a sort of uh, back to basics, a bit of an introduction to film. And then, as I said, we're going to talk about how to transition your story idea to a screenplay. And then we'll talk about the director's job and what differences are there between a feature film and uh, TVs. And then we'll also talk about, which I think is true that why watching foreign films is better for you as a beginner uh, or an in, intermediate filmmaker than Hollywood films, because I believe you get to learn more and, and, and these 
a variety of reasons for that which we'll get into. And then we'll talk about some case studies uh, of filmmakers that myself have admired and I think they are greatly admired in the film circle, in the filmmakers uh, community. So just share my screen. So the film industry basically has a lot of uh, people involved in making of a movie. We have, uh, we have directors, we have actors, we have writers, cinematographers. Uh, cinematographers basically are the directors of photography, those, those people who handle the cameras. And then we have art, art directors who handle like some aspects of production design. And then we have sound engineers. These are the uh, sound recordists. We have the boom pole and ETC. And uh, movies, uh, I would say movies, most people would tend to think that movies are just there to entertain you. But for me and many other filmmakers, I believe we, uh, there's much more. And, and the reasons for that is, First of all, movies record history. Yeah, they they capture current events, communities, uh, tra traditions at the time of that film being made. And when you look back at the films that you love uh, when you're growing up, or or even currently the films that you've loved, I'm sure you've you've noticed that they have a good uh, history in it. Yeah even if it's a comedy, uh, even if it's capturing, for example, world wars, uh, capturing uh, political dramas. These are things that for, 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 for posterity purposes, they are very useful. And also movies comment on current trends and technology, yeah? This I mean, maybe at the time uh, the film was being made, uh, the technology was the beginning of you know computers getting into the market and you'll see how people were fascinated by computers getting into the market examples uh, are those films about bill gates or steve jobs etc we have uh, films that are mainly focusing on mobile apps we have films that are going to be talking about uh, different kinds of fashion trends, etc. Uh, if you watch like those 70s films, you, you realize that most of them, people are wearing, are wearing flares and stuff like this. And it's always good to look back yeah, and, and see that. Yeah. Also, some movies imagine the future. These are like futuristic films where these, they, they have this, mostly it would be science fiction films and they would look ahead and, and probably in 2022, this is what would happening. And for you as an, as, a, as an audience, you would be entertained just looking at the possibilities that life has to offer, the possibilities for filmmakers to imagine how the future would look like, yeah? If it's going to be apocalyptic, that <laughs> the world is coming to an end, all these are good imaginations that, you know, fuel, uh, the filmmakers creative and imaginative mind yeah um, and also i say film matters because they, they have stories that you know they make us laugh they make us cry they make us hold our breath in suspense and if you really get into the world of film you will realize that it's it's not like um the world of business, it's very, um, it has a lot to offer, yeah? And, and basically I, I believe that it mirrors our hopes and fears and also our achievements and failures in life, yeah? So another great thing about films more than just entertaining, they, I think they act as teachers, yeah? And in this manner, I say that there are those young filmmakers, like even, even I myself, I wouldn't say that I'm totally into, I'm totally a guru, I would say, but 
I'm also learning from great teachers, uh, you know, like uh, those people who have been there before, even young writers, they learn from, um, sorry. So even great writers, they, they learn from uh, other, other, other professional uh, writers who have been there before. In Kenya, we have Ngogi Wathiongo and, sorry, uh, Shiko, was it not showing? Um, it was blurry, so I'll share it for you. Uh, just tell me which slide to go to. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so go previously. Down, yeah. down, next. Up, go up, up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more, one more slide up. All right, so basically I will, I will talk about uh, how to translate your story idea to a screenplay, yeah? And in almost every movie uh, or story that you see, the more you watch it, the better you are at, uh, the, better, the better you will be at uh, uh, movie making. And I, I would just use this one basic uh, classic simple story formula where you have a hero and then the hero faces a scary or a difficult adventure or problem um, and then this hero over eventually overcomes his fear and goes on an adventure and then he faces serious obstacles and then he manages to solve these serious obstacles and then he reaches his goal and then he learns a lot along the way now this formula may sound basic but a lot of excellent films actually have used this formula. And, and the power of a film comes from how the story is told basically. Yeah? And one of the main steps is to, or rather the intermediate tool that you use is to write a screenplay. Yeah? You transition the idea and, and you formulate it into a screenplay which is basically a language that filmmakers understand, yeah? And basically how to write a good, a good screenplay, you need to at least decide the story that you want to tell. Maybe you can move up again, uh, Shiko. Yep, yep, down there, yes. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, and then you will develop uh, interesting characters for that story. And then you will create uh, obstacles and interesting solutions to the problems that your characters face. Yeah. And then from there, you'll write your outline or rather write your idea in outline form, which we'll go into detail in the next slide. And then once you create this outline, then it's easy to transition into a screenplay. So the main questions that you would need to ask yourself are, what is the story idea? Once you get this story idea, where does the movie take place? Where, where is the location of this film? Yeah? And then who is the hero? Who is the protagonist? Who is the main character, I would say? Who do you want the characters to journey with? Yeah? And then what does he want? What are his wants? I call them um, the overall need you know in 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 even in in acting and how to direct actors every character needs to have an overall want and then in every scene he needs to have a scene need a scene need basically is what does the character want to achieve in this scene and this all plays out to his overall need or his his overall goal yeah so you have to create an overall goal Maybe it's to get that girl or to prove his worth that he's, you know, he's, he's the man of the family or something like that. 
And then in every scene you have to dissect towards this overall goal of achieving this girl or, or proving his want or, or proving his worth as a man in the, in the family. What are the small wants that he gets to uh, attain so that he's able to achieve this overall goal, yeah? And then try to think of what are the other characters? What is their relationship with your hero or your protagonist? Are they friends? Are they opponents? Try to think about interesting uh, people you've met. And it's, it's the, I think the, it's the easiest way uh, to use, you know, like to try and characterize interesting people you've met. Uh, of course, you have to change their names and stuff like this, but I've always found it when I'm, when I'm thinking of story ideas, I think about people I've met and I, I just describe how this guy was and I, I put him in the story. It doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be the character that the person I met is, but now I'm twisting it to, to, make, to fit the story basically, yeah? And then you ask yourself, what's the exciting thing that happens at the beginning of the story? Because remember, you have to hook your audience, especially in this world where we, we have a lot of consumption of media content, like there's an explosion. If you look at social media, there's a research I did that 70% of mobile networks that we, that, that we, 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 we have is video, 70%. So you can imagine the amount of content people are watching at the moment. But also there's, a, there's a, an opposing factor that says uh, attention span goes lower because you have so much content to watch. <laughs> you have an 11 minute video and then you're looking at it, it's too long. You think, okay, let me look for a two minute video. So the attention span of the audience or content consumers is going lower. So you have to balance these two, yeah? By using a lot of uh, visual storytelling, I would say, for example, to, to hook your audience. So even in film, it's the same thing, yeah? Try to hook your audience. If it's a feature film, in the first 10 minutes, they say in the first 10 pages, a producer, and Shiko will uh, agree with me here, a producer will tell if a story or if a, if a, if a script is worth uh, producing, yeah? And even in short films, it's the same, yeah? And, 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 and I think the best way to get, you know, your, your, your credibility okay and, and stuff like this is to start with short films, yeah? Um, because they're easier to play in, in, in film festivals where basically you get to meet a lot of people who will actually, or rather you'll work with to achieve this feature film idea that you may have. And the other thing is you ask yourself in this outline, uh, who gets into the hero's way? Yeah, who is the person that the hero has to overcome to achieve probably his want or his goal? Yeah, it could be someone is standing in the hero's way or an obstacle, maybe a situation or a circumstance that uh, he has to overcome, yeah? And then think about what are the solutions that he, your, your hero has to come up with, yeah? And then when everything, when you find all this, then you, you just think of how to resolve everything. How, how do you uh, make a, clim a climatic end, yeah? And also in some cases, you may, you may want the audience to learn something from it, yeah? And you can also try to think about First of all, does your hero learn anything? And this will mirror what the audience feel at the end of the film, yeah? So let's get into directing. <laughs> um, well, directing is a, is, a, is a, I would say a very large word, but I believe a director in a sense is, is like a teacher because basically he, he instructs some cast and crew, and basically he explains his vision. And, and the, the biggest work is very simple. And I believe it's just to express your vision and work with the characters 
Yeah, first of all, you need to first understand the script. Once you understand the script, then you, you will know that uh, the characters are the main drivers of the, of, the, of the story, yeah? And it is how strong you are to work with the actors to express your vision for them to uh, put it you know, on screen because we, we call them on screen talent. <laughs> So they're the ones to really express um, your, your, your style and, and the success or the failure of a director somehow would be attributed to if, if maybe the, the, the cast don't pull off a good show or something like this. Because technically, I believe most directors are technical directors. I believe that they are very they know where to put the camera, they know how they want the film to sound, they know, you know, how they want the lighting, the art design, but working with the car, working with actors is one of the, you know, the hardest parts, yeah? How do you handle a human being like yourself? You yourself as a director, you don't like taking instructions. So to balance how to, you know, this other person is also a human being like you probably he also doesn't like instructions but how do you you know how do you maneuver with them to create this uh, very great story like a very good script can turn into a very bad film and a very uh, let's say a medium kind of script can turn into a very good uh, film and it's really the director's uh, strength to to be able to you know, uh, learn with learn and 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 you know basically sh um, be effective, yeah. Using his um, his imagination to tell this story, yeah. And uh, I would say if um, it is the director's challenge to make his vision translate from story to movie, and you can do this if you if you if you if you get involved in films and if you get uh, to do a film, you will be able to learn how to develop a story with interesting characters. You'll be able to create a visual storyboard and show the camera angles, the, the distance, and the subjects. Basically, a storyboard is like a visual representation of how you want the shots to look and plan a filming schedule, yeah? And then from there, you learn how to utilize the cameras, the sound and the lighting techniques, working with the actors. All this comes with a lot of experience when you get into film. You don't have to be the one calling the shots. You don't have to be the one, like uh, Shiko said, the director called, calls the shots in films. And then in, in TVs, it's the, the showrunner, the producers or the writer, yeah? Um, so just get into any kind of production. I'm sure you will get to learn a lot. Even in my own previous productions when I was beginning, um, you know, like <laughs> I once attended the film, um, it was, it's called Youth in Platform. It's based in Kembo. Uh, they were teaching how to like an introduction to media and, and stuff like this. And I was doing it part-time uh, on a Saturday. And I remember they, they came, there was a debate on who is going to direct the overall film. So the teacher or the other, the instructor suggested that, okay, for us to decide that we have to, everyone has to direct a film every week. I think it was six months, a six months course. So every week we were doing a film and the strength of the person who is good at directing was the one to really overall do the overall film, which was, uh, which was going to be a, co a conjunction with uh, USIU and a couple of other film schools, yeah. And you know, you could already see there are people who say, "I'm good at directing, I'm good at directing," but when it came to to to, to the set, you often found that some people never thought of other things; they only thought of the script, but they never thought of the story which is the basic focus or the main focus of a director because 
you you end up thinking okay i mean i have actors who are going to say these lines and they say these lines the the camera shoots and that's it my, my work is done but when you think critically about it you have to think of easily how to problem solve some things don't work when you're doing it live and let's say you're working with an actor doing like a, um, rehearsals really help because you may you may see a line of dialogue on the script and then think okay this is going to good yeah this is it makes sense but when um when the when the actors really say it on camera then you feel like okay doesn't doesn't look right doesn't sound right and the your ability to you know problem solve and and be able to sh shift with the changes on set is also what is going to determine how your how the outcome of the film eventually will look like yeah um so the first step i would say before you get into any kind of production is to first understand and work with the script yeah the first you you have three reads you have you know like you're reading to get an idea of the story the first time you read it the second time you're reading to get in get in touch with the characters get in touch with how you're going to actually do it and the third one now you're going to you're going to read it to get into the film apply your vision yeah it's no longer now understanding the story it's now how are you going to express this or translate this to a visual medium yeah and then once you're able to understand the script this is where you can use storyboards which i talked about where you can you can draw stick figures stick figures are, are fine as well you can just draw how you want the camera to capture this moment or this dialogue or this character or this situation that way that way yeah and the second thing is now you have to work with the actors be comfortable with them before even you go to a production uh, try as much as possible to meet with the actors get to know them get to know their temperament there are those who you know if you don't set boundaries before the you will have a lot of hard time on set there are those who are controlling there are those who have been in the industry a lot of time or, or longer than you and then when you're on set you feel intimidated and you know they're saying okay that doesn't make sense to mr director stuff like this and then you, you have to okay let's go with your style you think you look like you're more experienced and sometimes it happens a lot yeah when when especially if you if you're if you if you've cast like a well-known actor or someone who has been in the industry for long yeah and if you don't control probably the set with the actors then it will no longer be your story it will just be you know you're feeding people's opinions into your story and eventually the, the the outcome of the story will look like was this director sure of what he wanted to do you know like it's always good to start working with the actors even before you think of going to production yeah now i know sometimes it's different with tv because tv you have you know you have limited time and getting to do all these things is a bit difficult but people always try to make a way even if it's a day or 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 half a day it's just good enough to first of all know your actors explain your vision to them so that we are all on the same page yeah the other thing is stick to the to the schedule and i was fortunate enough to attend a, a filmmaking course in germany uh, baden württemberg for one year uh and there we were able to make uh, films and this this special school actually and i will put a link on the on the chat as well for you to apply because they usually have uh, scholarships so you have you have international classes where people from different parts of the country come together for to this one class and then you immediately begin pre-production and development of a film like i think that the second week that's when you're you're asked okay what's your story idea 
and all through eight months, you, you now create a story for your, for your end thesis, yeah, for your end project, yeah. And there, there are people who, you know, they are mostly writers, and then now they have to find out, okay, I have to now direct a film. Some of them are just as cinematographers or, or visual artists. But the main thing that I also learned there was because it's Germany, they stick to the schedule. And that's a, a, a very important attribute that I learned that even five minutes can cost you so much headache. <laughs> yeah. And let's say you have a nine page script. How do you know, okay, nine pages, how do I, how long will it take for me to shoot this film? Now you have to understand one page is one minute of film. So nine pages should span across roughly three days, right? Yeah. So if you if you end up, let's say in on, on day one, you're still doing an establishing shot on the first page <laughs> or, or or the second page, you know that you you have a lot of headache away ahead of you. So you have to mitigate this uh, lost time to be able to capture the few scenes. And when, when you learn this discipline, you know, when you go to like professional films, you'll, understand, you'll see that if you take an actor's day and then let's say you, something happens, you don't shoot that day, the next day you have to shoot. It's going to cost you over budget. That's why you find some directors go over budget with productions because things have delayed, they've not been able to probably stick to the schedule. They're very uh, rigid in terms of, you know, some things happen on set and then you had this cool idea that you wanted to do something and then you have to forget about it. Now, it helps when you're able to, when you're able to be open, yeah? And to be open-minded that things can change. You, you, the good idea that you had had to change because if, if you don't, then, you know, there are, there are other consequences that will follow you in terms of losing money, yeah, and things like this. So it's very important to, to at least stick to the schedule. And if, if, you, if something happens that you're not able to do that, you, you should ask yourself, can I get an extra day of shooting? Or can I change the script so that the last few scenes do not need to probably happen? Or how do I, you know, mitigate this, yeah? The other thing is working with the crew and the crew basically is all the people behind the camera. So I think the most important person in the crew for, for a director, I would say is, is an assistant director because when you're on set, you, you get to forget a lot of things. And the person who is your right-hand man is, is your assistant director. He's going to at least remind you of the the shot that we haven't taken is going to time keep you. You know, you have to also meet with them early and then you just tell them that, you know, time is money. So make sure that, you know, if we've scheduled a shoot for a shot for, for like five minutes, make sure we stick to it. And, and if we go overboard, try to mitigate that time and if there's another shot that is scheduled for another 10 minutes, let's make it five minutes so that we're able to cover the time that we lost before, yeah? So. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I think it's also important to mention, you know, there's um, software and there are platforms out there that can assist you with timekeeping and scheduling and budgeting. You know, like at ADMI, we use Yamdu. You um, upload all the crew on their call sheets, budget, shooting schedules, budgets. Um, daily reports and all those things or you know using movie magic for budgeting just so that you're also able to keep track um of of these things because um as as a producer and i've also been a, a production manager um keeping track of funds is is key it's important you know you have to account for every single penny that you spend and if you can't you know it comes out of your pocket in in most cases so yeah. there, there are very many platforms and scheduling platforms and budgeting platforms that we can use to, to make this process a bit, a bit easier. 
Good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Shiko, for that. That's very useful. And then the other, the other thing is to check your day's shooting. Now, sometimes you may have an editor on set who is going to, let's say you, sh you shoot a scene and then quickly he goes to his computer, you know, imports the footage, tries to do a very overall general rough cut. Yeah? Always try to check with this because it will inform if you need to reshoot a scene or if you like how a scene plays out, it's always good to check at the end of the day how the shots look. And if you, if you don't maybe have uh, an editor on set who is going to do it, then try to skim through the footage that you, that you have, yeah? So that you ensure that we call them the dailies or the rushes. All these are what you want, yeah? Because you don't want to have three days of shooting and then you look at the footage at the end of the three days and then you're like, okay, we didn't do good shots in first day. And then you, now you have to think of how to fix it in post, which is the worst idea, yeah? <laughs> um, and then work with the editor. Sometimes you may happen to be the editor. Sometimes you may have to work with an editor. There's a, in my experience, there's a film called 18 Hours, which I edited and uh, thankfully it was able to win the Africa Magic Viewers Choice Award for best editing actually in best overall film. And I was, this, this was the first time I was actually working with a director. Like I'm a director myself, but I'm also an editor. So at this point, uh, he was interested in my editing work, this director. So we, we, we met and we laid out some, you know, some ground rules, yeah? And I told them to give me two weeks undisturbed. This was time for me to reflect on the film, time for me to reflect on the story, time for me to reflect on, this, on the footage. What are the possibilities of how I can cut this story, yeah? And those two weeks are very useful for you. Uh, and even, even for, if you're going to be a director, try to give your editors some space, yeah? Give them time to internalize the story, give them time to reflect on the story so that they can input their own uh, creative creativity into it, yeah? And I think this is, this is a process that can take a long time, uh, you know, editing and post-production uh, because it's, it's very technical and, and and actually it depends on the complexity of the film, yeah? But it's always very good to have good relationship with your editor and, and aligned, aligned styles, I would say, yeah? Um, yeah, so I would say that those are mainly important uh, director's job. And then now I'll jump into the differences between uh, feature films and TV. Now, I would say that uh, television and, 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 and feature films have gone through some interesting changes in, in recent years. Some feature films have taken the aspects of television, which basically means the span of a multiple movies we have you know, sequels, we, we call them sequels. So they, they have a story that continues in like four or five different films, yeah? And then we have some television shows that have, that have basically have more film-like qualities in terms of writing and certain technical aspects. We have examples of House of Cards, which, which really look like, looks like a film, like, if you watch the first few episodes, you feel like, you know, like you're watching a, a, a film. And, and the first, I think House of Cards was the first few episodes were directed by David Fincher, who basically I really admire. And he set the tone for how the production will look over the next three or four seasons. And I think that's one of the main reasons also it has been quite successful because it, it gave you this this feeling like you're actually, you know, watching a very technical production, yeah? 
And we also have Narcos, which, which is also a very well told story. And despite this, you know, these similarities and uh, they still have some notable differences. And I feel like the notable differences are mostly into writing, into the, the scripts mostly. And TV scripts basically are shorter than, 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 than feature films, of course, because a, a TV script for uh, a television show will span over maybe 20, 25 minutes to 30 minutes and if it's a longer longer TV show, it will go for 60 minutes. But feature films, you know, they can go for over 90 minutes or 90 pages, um, or even you know 200 pages, depending on the length of the film. Yeah. Another difference is is the different narrative structures because for film, it has most of them have a clear beginning, middle and end, yeah? But while for TV, it can, because they are episodic, it can start in the middle and then in between you're taken flashbacks in episode five, you take taken to the end again, it can, you know, rearrange itself that way. So it doesn't have, it has, it, it could have multiple beginnings, you know, multiple middles and ends, yeah? And, each each part is a is part, like each TV script or each episode is part of a larger narrative for the whole story. Yeah. Another difference I think is that TV scripts don't have to like resolve a problem right away. Maybe a character is facing a certain problem at that episode one. You don't have to resolve it in that episode. You can do it in season two or even season three. People will still remember because remember you're, you're creating different stories in this TV script. But in film, you know, you, at the end of the film, you have to, you have to sort of try and resolve the, 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 the problem, yeah? Or the, the, to get a solution, yeah? And another thing is, uh, another difference I would say is also TV scripts are a bit, uh, dialogue driven yeah uh, it can most most of them focus on 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 the writing rather than the visuals but as I, as i mentioned before we've seen this shift of of tv tv state tv uh, programs ad adapting to film like technical qualities yeah and i think it's a very exciting uh, transition and yeah i think you know, putting considered cinematography into TV script is also a, a, a huge step that I would even suggest. Um, but I also feel like people should do more films <laughs> because, you know, TV shows, I would say they, they, they help like a lot of crew make money. And that's in Kenya, I would say is is the, the go-to, like we have developed good ways of, 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 of doing TV shows, but we are still lacking a bit in, in film because we only have a handful of films you can count that have been successful, uh, even uh, international wise, yeah? So I always try to, you know, tell people, try to, you know, make more films, yeah? But it's, I know it's very hard, even in terms of funding everybody, even uh, in my experience when I was in, in, in Germany was, you know, even making films is not easy. Like all of them, we are all suffering, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then the last difference is TV shows require more writing in the long run, yeah? Uh, because a TV, a TV, a TV series can span over, I don't know, 50 episodes. Like the one I'm working on, Kina, I think season one has 218 episodes. <laughs> yeah, and each episode is roughly 26 minutes. So you can imagine the amount of writing that goes into this uh, TV series, yeah? so. If you're going to be making a TV series, don't, don't think that it's gonna it's not gonna be successful. So I'll just write five episodes. But we also have 
you know, like mini series. We have uh, Band of Brothers, which is a very good war film, war TV series. It span over like uh, ten episodes, um, and a couple of you know good short mini series that have been quite successful. Yeah. Uh, now I want us to talk about why I think watching foreign films would be better than um, like would would be better than Hollywood films, and this also was informed by my experience also when I was when I was studying uh, in Germany because I got to see a lot of art house films. Art house films are those films that are not main majored for the main market, for the main mass market. These are not the blockbusters. And unfortunately in Kenya, these are the films that we will end up watching, these blockbusters, the, the Fast and Furious, the, the, the Transformers. And in my experience already, if, if you're thinking of starting how to do a film, you would be intimidated okay, how do I get to, to work with the transformer? How do they do this? And then when you look at the technology that they use, they are way ahead of us. So you're like, you know, like you don't have good examples of telling a story. So the best I would say are films that, you know, are easier to grasp, yeah? And I would say foreign films are examples of this, yeah? You can watch like South African films, South African foreign films. You can watch a lot of good films are coming from South Korea, like Parasite. You know that that film won the Oscars as a foreign film. It was the first time this was happening. So you can see, and this is a story that even as a basic, you know, filmmaker, these are films that you can make because it was a very simple story, only told in a very different way, in in an in an unconventional way. Yeah. So you get to experience different cultures and different perspectives in foreign films. And if you intending to maybe sell your film outside there, most of them would like to feel the culture of the country the film is coming from, or even if it's not coming from that country, to feel that different culture. Because as human beings, we embody the, we embody the same kind of humanistic characters, but if you put maybe the characters in a in a in a in a in a in a different place, yeah, in a in an interesting place, people will be engaged. That's why you'll you'll be engaged when watching Narcos with all the subtitles that it has. You'll you'll be there all through because you want to know how Colombia is. Is this how Colombia operates? Is this how 1970, 1980, 1990, when Pablo was king, is yeah. So even in, even like, I remember when I was beginning, I used to, we used to reenact with my brother, a lot of James Bond films and Hitman films and speak this, you know, this American dialect, which you're gonna do, you know, stuff like this. <laughs> but later on, I came to learn that, you know, that like, it doesn't appeal, especially even to international, actually you lose both because local audience will feel like you're, okay, the, this is not how we speak. This is not how this character looks like. His speak is not comfortable with the way he speaks. And you'll find that even short films that probably are screened in Alchemist or Power to Five Four, you'll find that some of the dialogue is very Americanized. So even the characters when they're speaking, you feel like, okay, like he's not comfortable delivering that dialogue. And it's because we end up, you know, applying a lot of you know, like a lot of American culture into our own culture. That's why, for example, The River, The River is the South a South African uh, TV series, which was very successful, but it, they spoke their language. And in between, they would just use small English interne uh, words, yeah? But the majority of it, it had, their own language with subtitles. And you would watch it because you felt like this is how South Africa is. This is how people speak. And it was very authentic, yeah? And the authenticity of, you know, like watching foreign films will also help you make your own film 
for local audience and even for international audience, yeah? The other thing is that they, you get to experience different stories. Now, I've used an example of this, you know, the, 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 the classic comedy where the girl works, you know, the, there's a girl that works really hard to get a guy, gets a guy and then realizes that she should be with the best friend all along, yeah? Now, for example, if you watch a lot of uh, foreign films, they are very um, mind intuitive, yeah? They really go deeper and they, they always try to show a different perspective. They can show this story from the best friend's perspective as opposed to now the main girl, yeah? And, and it's always good to get these different stories all through, yeah? And uh, the other thing is try to see, like foreign films will try to see someone else's norm. Uh, I've, go, I've, I've grown to appreciate a lot of small details in filmmaking and you know, a lot of foreign films will use lighting, like the person I'm going to talk about in the next slide, uh, uh, Pedro Aldomova, he uses a lot of lighting props to, to, you know, to communicate a certain visual style. He uses a lot of props and the costume. And these are elements that are very important for you. Even when you're watching, you get to see a different kind of life a different kind of uh, how some how other people live in a different part of the world, yeah. Uh, let's go to Pedro Aldomova. Now, uh, I know this 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 is someone probably most people would wouldn't know about, but this is a very accomplished filmmaker. And how I came to, I did, actually didn't know him until 2017. <laughs> so uh, I, I made a film called Neophobia, which uh, was selected for screening at the 70th Cannes Film Festival in France. And when I, when I went there, Pedro, Pedro was the head jury, uh, who was now, sorry, the person to select the best films, yeah? He was the head jury of, of the committee, yeah? And when I, when, I, when I started looking over his films, because, you know, everyone was talking about Pedro, like you want to see Pedro, like on the red carpet when he was walking in, it was a whole, it was like Muhammad Ali, you know? <laughs> and, uh, that's where, that's where my interest started. I wanted to find out, okay, who is this? And, and it, it, that, that basically that's how it, you know, when you don't know someone and then someone really adores them, then you want to, okay, let me, let me find out about him. So I started watching his films and ever since it has really, it, it totally changed my perspective to, to filmmaking, especially to how we approach storytelling. Um, because I believe his films almost like talk to each other. His films are very, um, they're, they're, they're very, I would say, <laughs> that they have different ways or, or very unconventional kind of storytelling. I'll specifically talk about uh, Talk to Me. Um, I think, Onjiko, you don't have that slide. Let me just see if this works. Also, uh, remember you can keep uh, posting your questions in the Q&A. We've seen the ones that are already there and we will answer them. Yeah, so before I got to, uh, before I get to talk to me, I'll just, like, you can look at the, uh, <laughs> the amount, amount of awards he's, he's gotten with his work, like, 
two Oscars, two directing Oscars, five BAFTAs, uh, six European Film Awards, two Golden Globes, nine Goya Awards, and four prizes at the film festival. I believe this is more than any other foreign filmmaker has been able to achieve, yeah? Uh, so Talk To Me basically is, Talk To Her, Talk To Her is basically a film that tells the story of two men who bond while taking a woman who is in a coma. And as simple as that story sounds, it was, it was very engaging because you can imagine it was a bit dialogue driven. So it's just two men talking to a woman in a coma. But this film, as you can see, it, it won an Oscar Academy for best screenplay and he was nominated for best director. And the YouTube link is, is um, I think I should, I'll post this as well on the chat so that you can be able to look, uh, look at the film. Um, and and the, actually the universal acclaim mostly came because of the unconventional cinematic uh, techniques that he used, you know, the modern dance. And there were a lot of places that he would use silent filmmaking where basically there's no dialogue and then you have a lot of music playing you know the symphonies yeah and already this will make you get into how you know spanish people live yeah um another film i watched of of, of him is is volva which is a 2006 film well, this film was quite personal for, for him because he used some elements from his own childhood to craft a story about just three generation of women. Uh, it, it was, I think, an 18 year old, uh, a 35 year old and a 55 year old with how they deal with sexual abuse, grief, secrets and death. So you would see that a, a, a 17 year old will be you know, it, it will be the first time it's happening. It's, you know, like all these things that that would happen to any person for the first time, that experience, and then you combine it with someone who has some experience of it, and then someone who has tremendous experience of it, yeah? And the way these stories are crafted, they look very simple but they they show you a different part of the world how they deal with these things and the good thing is it embodies every human like when you're watching it you will feel like what would i have done like they involve you already yeah and i always love this kind of films where you journey with the character like the the characters you relate with them but these characters have been put in extraordinary situations and that will prompt you to ask yourself, okay, if it were me in, in her situation, what would I do? How did she deal with it? So already you journey with the character and then you're also asking yourself questions. Yeah. And that's actually one of the uh, good ways to tell, to, to know that you've told a story that you're engaging your viewer to, 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 to journey with the character. Yeah. Um, another film also, the last one, it's, it's Pain and Glory. Please watch this film. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think there are some, um, you can try and look online. They have, uh, I can post a link. There's a streaming web, uh, there's a free streaming website which you can watch this film. It's, it's really a very good film. And, and basically it just talks about a director whose career has picked and anyone watching who wants to be a director should at least try and get uh, to watch this film because it talks to every newbie director. It talks to every, even if like you can be 40 and starting to direct, you're still, you know, you're still getting into the directing. And this, this is a good film to watch, to be able to, you know, like, see the possibilities of, of, of being a director, what comes with it, because it's, it's not all smooth sailing as a director. We have problems as well. Like 
like directors have different kinds of issues they have to deal with. They have to deal with uh, maybe the weather didn't turn out very well. <laughs> yeah, different kinds of problems and how to, in the film, maybe you learn how the director, you know, dealt with all these problems. And it's very, uh, it's very engaging to watch. Please watch. Um, so we've moved to another director that I love. Shiko, is this clear enough? Mm, no, but I've switched it to mine. Okay. So another one of my favorite directors is David Fincher. Now, David Fincher is, is for those who may have known his work, is a very, uh, He's a very technical director. He's very, he, most of his stories are about serial killers, are about robbers or murderers. But the way he tells them are, it has a very distinct style. Like you would, if you watch any, 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 any of his films, let's say someone doesn't tell you this is David Fincher's work. You can easily tell this is David Fincher's work because the camera moves like no one is operating it. it. It moves at angles, yeah, like 45 degree angle, 180. Degree. It's very, it's very mechanical, I would say, yeah. And he learned this over time. Like if you watch his first films, were like the first film he was given to do. It was a studio based uh, film, and it didn't turn out very well because. You know, studios sometimes, especially when you're starting out, they will tend to control you. They will tend to um, put in their own input and creative control into the, the project. So eventually you won't feel like it's your own film. But <clears throat> once he was able to now have creative control in films, you could, he was like his artistic, uh, ability flourished, yeah? So that's uh, David Fincher. And as you can see, he has a very distinctive style that he started, uh, he has been approaching every film with. And just quickly on the, on the Q and A, um, I don't know, Shiko, would you like to answer some questions or do I start? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I see there's a question here that says, why do we have less multicam productions locally? Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, multi-camera productions are very, very, very expensive. You need a lot of equipment and a lot of people. So you would have to be able to purchase all this equipment and pay all these people. So um, local productions don't have that um, expansive of a budget to be able to keep doing multi-camera productions. Okay, and then I see, um, I understand you have an extensive career in production. What's the most difficult production problem uh, you've ever come across and how did you go about it? <laughs> um, well, in, in, in my journey, I came to discover earlier on that um, in production, production manager, producer, production coordinator, because I've, I've been in all these roles, my job was people. And, and as Mark had said earlier, it's, it's very difficult um, to manage people. We are all different. We have different personalities, different upbringing, beliefs, you know, different cultures. So um, learning to be able to manage all these people and to, to get them to work together or for all of us to work together towards our common goal and our production output at the beginning was difficult for me. So what I decided is, okay, my job is people. So let me get to learn the people that I work with. And thankfully for me, they were the same. Um, every, all the, the, say the crew was more or less 90% the same people. So it was easier for me to learn them, learn small things about them. Uh, I remember there's a director we had who, he had diabetes. So what I would do is I would carry a chocolate bar in my bag. Cause I knew when the director starts yelling at the crew, 
it could be that you know uh, he has to replenish his sugar so that's what i would do or one of our on-screen presenters had asthma so i'd carry an inhaler in my car just to understand that my job is people and making their work easier made my work easier um maybe mark you can take some now yeah the, there's someone who asks what the term b-roll basically means and b-roll is is, is is footage that is outside of the main action. This, these are footage that you're going to shoot either with no sound or with very minimal sound and it, it, will, it will help support your story. This probably you have seen, maybe, maybe it's a documentary and someone is talking and then he's talking about people on the streets doing something. And then over that footage, you'll see people walking in the streets, wherever the person is talking about, this is, this is a B-roll footage. Maybe it's an establishing shot. And, and you'll see in a lot of films, they usually start with these shots. It's called principal photography. These are shots that, you know, like establishing shots are those, you know, B-rolls that you're going to be, uh, that are going to be shot by probably a second unit camera department or something, yeah. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, our film industry has one major problem, funding. What is your opinion in, and uh, the way forward? Now, over the couple of, I think in the, in the last couple of years, we've been having a lot of uh, NGOs and, and organizations that are hosting you know, film competition where you get to win a prize to get some money for development. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of organizations at the moment that are you know, helping filmmakers. We have the Sundance, um, Sundance has a very good culture in, in, in upcoming filmmakers to, have to support them. Um, but the only issue with this is because especially most of this you'll learn that they are international organizations. And most of them, you will see that they will provide funding for documentaries. And when you, when you get into now getting film uh, fund for films, some of them will require that you, 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 you tell a story that will be internationally appealing. So even in your own story idea, ideation or development, when you're thinking of, if you intend to, um, you know, target a, a particular company, at least make sure that they have something to benefit. Like for example, uh, 18 Hours, the feature film that I worked on, uh, it was a story about a person who was knocked down uh, and left for dead by, uh, it was like, he had a hit and run, yeah? And then there was this ambulance that came to save him, but no hospital would admit him because he didn't have insurance, medical insurance. And some of them were asking a lot of money up front, like 100K just to be admitted and, and be taken to the ICU bed and stuff like this. So this guy didn't have that money. So basically the filmmakers targeted emergency hospitals, emergency departments to mitigate what you know, what should we do? Should we change a law that at least the hospital should admit someone before even like, don't, don't dish out someone before even you have a look at him. It targeted these organizations that would also benefit from it, yeah? And, and the, they, they got good funding. Like you, you, can, you can approach politicians who maybe uh, in your story, they, it's something they've, they've had in, on their agenda, yeah? Uh, I think at the time, Mike Sonko was able to provide the production with about 100,000. 100, and it's because it aligned with his, you know, his improvement of the city, how to improve em emergency uh, departments in the country, yeah? So do a lot of research. There's definitely plenty of uh, resources to be able to get some funding, but also try in your story, try to make sure that whichever organization you're applying your fund from, that it aligns with their interest and aspirations to support, yeah? 
someone also asked if it's possible to have a 265 episodes in a series. Yes, Kina has 281, <laughs> which is season one. And I think, you know, like season two, season three, they will, depending on how, you know, successful season one will be, they may end up going more and more. So it's very possible. Uh, someone asked, if I'm not a filmmaker, but I have a story that I feel I can, that I feel can be a great film, what advice can you give to develop it? Um, how can I speed up the learning curve and still create good quality? Well, <laughs> the learning curve, you can't, you can't speed that up. It, 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 you get better with, 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 with experience because, you know, filmmaking is, is more like a painter or, or someone who's trying to learn how to play guitar. You won't become good on your second day or third day. You have to experience it because for film, you have to, you have to encounter problems. And how you solve these problems is what will improve you. It's what will help you create better content. But if you're not a filmmaker and you're interested and you have a story that you want to tell, I would advise you can approach uh, different filmmakers. Um, unfortunately, at this time of COVID-19, uh, you know, not many people are out there, but we have different platforms on Facebook. Um, even when you go to the National Archives, you'll get to meet a lot of filmmakers there. Try to talk to them, you know, get some contacts uh, so that they can help you develop it. They can help you make that story a realization. I think that's, I'm not sure if there's any other way you can do this besides just meeting the filmmakers themselves and, and telling them a story, convincing them it's a, it's a good story. You can also attend uh, like the alchemist is, is a very good example uh, where you meet filmmakers and, and it's, it's, they just host uh, screenings for short films. So that is one, you have shots, shots, shot, shots and shot, <laughs> which, is, uh, <laughs> which is hosted by DocuBox. Um, there also you get to meet professional filmmakers. I've had my film uh, screened there as well a couple of times. You can go to Power 254. Um, these are places you get to meet, you know, filmmakers and then talk to them, see the possibilities basically, yeah. Okay, um, there's someone who asks, what in your experience is the most important quality in a TV producer? Um, there, there are very many, you need to be able to work with people, you, but for me, my, the most important one is you need to be organized. Uh, production comes with a lot of administrative work, a lot of paperwork, so you need to be organized and you need to know how to operate on a schedule and you need to know how to operate with time. I always tell people, you know, in television, time is our currency. That's what we, we butter with, it's time. You can't afford to, to lose time because even five minutes, one minute, it costs a lot of money. Um, so time is always sticking. So you need to, to be very organized in, in the way that you structure your production. Okay. Um, there is another one here that says, I think Mark, this is for you. Are there specific types of directing styles in film production? Okay, um, I just wanted to ask if sports production is a course on its own or is it generalized as film and TV production? Uh, sports production is a multi-camera production, just like um, uh, all the other multi-camera productions. So it's classified as TV production. Okay. Um, Mark. Yes. There's a question here that says, why do you think we have few ladies in film production? Is it a diff difficult career? No, actually I think that we have more ladies. I don't know why the person thought that they have few ladies. What I think maybe we, we have 
more producers who are ladies. And I would say the reason for that is I think, I think, you know, like administrative wise in terms of film and discipline, um, I would say ladies are a bit more attuned to it. Um, but on a general film crew, I feel like we have a, 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 quite a mix. Yeah, we have, we, we have quite a mix. I'm not, I don't think there are ladies who feel like it's a, it's a hard career. That's why they, they, they choose not to. Actually, art is a very good career to get into. Uh, both for for both genders. So, yeah. Uh, so someone else has asked, are there specific directing styles in film production? Well, you know, directing styles are basically informed by how you, you what your principles as, are in terms of how you use music, how do you move the camera, how do you use production design, um, and and how how you use these elements to tell your story is is eventually what is going to uh, you know inform your directing style. Uh, I have like I have followed Sp Steven Spielberg, who is you know one of the most successful uh, filmmakers in Hollywood, um, and his distinctive style is how he, first of all, he uses production design to open a film. And he always moves the camera to a close up when, when, when you want to show emotion. He always uses circles. Let's say you want to, sh like mirrors. Uh, he would use a reflection of a mirror instead of a shot reverse shot. You know, the, the, you shoot a shot and then you, of someone looking at something and then you shoot a shot of what they're looking at. But Spielberg likes to do it on the same frame. So he would either use something, a mirror, which is circle, a side mirror, or a reflection somewhere in the cabinet, a reflection in the window. He always likes to do that. So how you, how you basically use these styles will inform you your directing style, like we've seen uh, in the video with um, David Fincher. He likes to move the camera like no one is operating. It's very mechanical because that's what he believes, like to make it pure. And, and also he uses production design very meticulously to make sure everything looks good. Like if you watch his, his last five, five films, you'll notice this, there are no mistakes. Like everything looks perfect, <laughs> and 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 people will be able to tell that's a David Fincher film by those attributes. So I wouldn't say specifically that you were narrowed down to, you know, like you have a confrontational kind of uh, directing style where you use dialogue in your films. Like we have those filmmakers as well who use dialogue throughout in their films, and and it's very creative dialogue. We have example is quarantine. Quentin Tarantino, mm -hmm. who, who has very good dialogue in his films. And that's also a style. Like if you watch a Quentin Tarantino film, dialogue, people, has, people have sat down and they're talking for 10 minutes and you're still there listening because it's very engaging. That's a kind of directing style. Like he also has a style of using violence or rather he's called to be glorifying violence. So when, when blood splatters, it splatters like you've been smacked with some ice cream, you know? <laughs> so th those are different kinds of uh, directing styles as well. And it all depends with your vision and what you believe in your principles. And, and you, you, I think you attain this by watching a lot of films, a lot of other people's work as well. Okay. Um... Please help me understand, <clears throat> excuse me, the difference uh, between a director and a producer, uh, their roles. So, well, in, in, in television, a producer is in charge of the overall production. In most cases, they're the ones who have written the show or they're the showrunner or the writer. They're the ones who hire and fire people. They're in charge of the budget and um, they have overall creative uh, or control or decision-making control when it comes to the direction the story is taking. 
in television and a director is just brought in to direct the technical aspects or to um, work on the technical aspects of the show. And in film, Mark. Which question was that? The difference of a director and a producer. The differences between a director and a producer, okay. So I would say in film, basically the director is the one to, sometimes you find that the producer will be the one to get a director. He'll be the one to ensure all the components of the film are brought together. He'll ensure that the budget, it depends on what kind of producer because we have different, we have executive producers, we have now producer, producer, we have uh, associate producers. All these play into the role of um, assisting the director in uh, achieving his story. But the director is the person who is in control on set. He's the person who is in control of the story. He's the person who, if the film goes well, he'll get the credit. If the film doesn't go well, he'll, he'll also get the bad, bad words. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think those, that is one of the, I think, a difference that I would, I would state. Sometimes you may find that you have a producer who is going to be directing the films, but Steven Spielberg is also a, a good example. So with time you get to, you know, learn the both skills and, and you get to know the advantages and the, 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 the disadvantages if you can handle it and, and how tasking it is and, and, and things like this. Okay, how should film professionals price their work? Hmm. I think normally uh, there's a standard that has been already set. Um, for example, if you're an actor, you're guided by a guild. It could be an actor's guild in your, in your, like in Kenya, we have like standardized prices for film professionals. And unfortunately, some of them don't apply to every production because I've had actors come to me and say, okay, I'm supposed to be paid 12, maybe 24,000 a day or 12,000 a day, but there's no production that can be able to afford that. Now, will I have to wait <laughs> for, for me to get that kind of production that will be able to handle that? Or do I keep you know, improving my skills with productions where you can negotiate your way with, with the producers? So, I think at the moment uh, we, we are still, you know, we, we are still not yet an industry that can be able to handle like standardized prices for everyone. But in other European countries, in, in Hollywood, we have these guilds that are able to standardize prices. And if you're like a visual artist or an editor, these prices depend on what you feel comfortable. You look at how much you're going to how long you're going to be working, what kind of, uh, what kind of material you're engaging with. Is it documentary? Is it a TV show? Is it a news, uh, news uh, object? Or So this will be able to inform your prizes. And it's also good to just listen to those who have been there because the good thing is the people who have already done it ahead of you. So seek advice from these people, know, uh, you know, like what are the standards in different kinds of scenarios because they are all very dependent. Okay. Um, how much does it cost to shoot a TV show on average in Kenya? Um, with all productions, the budget normally depends on the size of the production and the nature of the production because you're paying salaries, you're paying people, you're paying locations, you're providing meals, you're providing transport, depending on the work day, you're paying overtime. Um, sometimes you've hired equipment and all things like those. So um, I don't think it's a standard across the board uh, budget for each TV show, um, especially in Kenya. Uh, but TV shows can set you back maybe 400,000 and upwards per episode. Okay. Um, 
I'm currently involved in full-time advertising, but I have a cropping passion for film. Can I transition from the advertisement background to a notable filmmaker? Um, Mark? Can I transition from advertisement to be a notable filmmaker? Yes, you can, but you know, advertisement is 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 even difficult than in a in a in a film because you have 30 seconds to tell your story. <laughs> you have in a film you have I don't know 20 minutes, 10 minutes, you have a longer period to tell your story. And to squash this into a, a shorter period, you need to be a very visual uh, filmmaker, which means you have to know a lot of visual storytelling and some elements maybe include um, that first impressions matter. Some elements be, maybe show don't tell, which means uh, if you can show me something, don't tell me. So all this will be able, you know, you can, you can, you can transition seamlessly, but you know, you have to also be very creative to be able to get your audience engaged in the very few seconds. Now you can imagine if you're creating a 30 second piece, how, how long should you grab the audience's attention? It could be five seconds or 10 seconds, something that you, you know, that will be already appealing visually, yeah? So I think that those are the steps to improve your skills of how to do a, to be a good visual storyteller and then you can easily transition. Okay, and I think uh, as we head towards the end of this webinar, maybe we can answer how this pandemic has affected the film industry and if negatively, can the industry recover? Uh, yeah, tough question, you know. I, th I don't think any of us have a, has an answer for that, whether we, but what I believe even now people are creating content. There's like Kenya Film Commission has initiated different competitions. There's a mobile film competition where you, you tell a story three to five minutes about the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, we have people, if you, if you go over on YouTube, there are people, or rather even Facebook, there are a lot of filmmakers who are creating content right now to keep, keep up you know, their, their work uh, going, keep up their uh, skills improving. But I don't think like we've been totally disadvantaged. The only thing that maybe is, 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 is going to be painful is that people are you know, losing their savings. People are not getting work. Um, but I think time will tell, time will tell. Okay. Um... What's the best way to transition in a show from one set of characters to another? Um, a lot of show writers normally use dialogue as, as transitions uh, because TV shows are very heavily dialogue driven. And I saw a comment here that said, um, you know, uh, the shows have a lot of dialogue and they were comparing them to, you know, shows that were earlier like Charlie Chaplin, who didn't, it was just, it just had like a music bed. So in television, they usually use uh, dialogue as a lot of transitions to show us where we are going, who we are going to, even to tell us what type of, what time of the day we are in. So you'll hear a character say, good morning, good afternoon, and things like that, just for us to be able to tell where it is we are in the world of the story. And uh, about cinematography, do we need those cameras working in different angles, depending on image movement? Um, Mark? Do we need? The camera yes. angles. Do we need those cameras working in different angles depending on the image movement? Well, I would say 
I would advise this also as an editor because it gives you the flexibility to cut. Uh, if you have different angles of someone, of two people talking, one, one is stationed on person A and then the other one is, is positioned on person B, it's very easy and seamless to intercut between the two. So basically it saves you time even in shooting and even in post-production. So I would say that is one of the main advantages. The only disadvantage is if you have very uh, choreographed movements, then one camera, you, you will take longer to set up that uh, movement because one camera cannot come in the way of the other. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of this webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and um, you know, going through the world of film and television with us. Um, it's an exciting time you know, for us to be in this industry as viewers, as creators, as creatives. So we hope you know, we'll be seeing more and more people coming into this uh, media world that we love and enjoy so much. Okay, so okay. thank you, Adi. Thank you very much for hanging with us. And yeah, we hope you learned a lot um, and see you on set. <laughs>